A common theme in the first season of Open Source in Business was supply chain management and the role that open source plays in it. Mike Milinkovic and Scott McCarthy both pointed to the key role that open source components play as part of product supply chains. And I think it's also important to understand that, I mean, um, open source is becoming a global supply chain, right? There's this underneath right. huge amount of the innovation that's happening around the world and in pretty much every sector of industry you can imagine. There's this open source pipe of enabling technology that is helping support all of this innovation. And, um, and th that global nature, uh, I think it makes a, the idea of having a, an open source foundation with the European legal framework um, based in Europe with infrastructure in Europe, um, interesting from a global perspective. I always launch with my, my pitch of like, I try to view open source as a supply chain for products, just like I would view any technology supply chain, whether you're building airplanes or cars or anything else. For example, like people ask, well, should I be going to DevCon, for example, people at Red Hat? And the, the answer, you know, product managers in particular, and you're like, well, it depends. Are you, is, you know, is System D or Podman or any of these other like low level projects in the supply chain for the product that you're building? For me, that happens to be true. So it's an absolute yes, right? It's the same thing as if I was an auto manufacturing and Bosch had a fuel injector conference and I was the product manager of, you know, powertrain systems or whatever. Of course, I would go to the, you know, the, the, the Bosch conference and like try to influence Bosch on whatever features they're going to add for my, you know, I would try to influence what I want for my product. This is the beauty of software in general combined, combined with open source. These two things together are magical compared to the fuel injector because the fuel injector costs $5 to manufacture and I just have to pay $7. Like I have to give Bosch enough money that they can make a profit and stay alive. And so this natural tendency to try to reduce the cost in the supply chain is a natural thing in all products. And so open source actually does this out of the box. Like again, as a PM, I look at it as it's a, it's a nonprofit entity that doesn't have sales and marketing costs. That's still building a great like supply chain product for me, essentially that I don't have to go pay for. And if I pay, if the way I pay is I dedicate engineers to it. So say I dedicate three engineers that cost hundred thousand dollars each. I'm dedicating three hundred thousand dollars, but I might be getting back a million dollars in product or five Easy. million. Easy. 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 Yeah. I mean, it's like Easy. outrageous the return on investment from open source. Like, uh, you know, it's just so much better than a physical supply chain. So it's a no brainer in a lot of ways. Matt Klein and Limor Fried point out some of the benefits of having open source or open components as part of your supply chain. Looking at the reality of how much software costs to develop, it's obviously in a company's best interest if they can take open source technology and they can mostly get what they need and potentially contribute some patches. Um, uh, that's almost always a better better way of operating. There is, it's prototyping, but also like, again, there, sometimes the hardware just gets used in a final product. Like I know for a fact that there's that there's companies that they're like, we have to buy five to 10,000 of this thing because we're gonna use it basically in a product. Is it prototyping at the point of 5,000 components? I don't think so. No. Um, yeah. So, you know, but they, they want something that they can modularly use and they know it works great. Um, could they design their own custom PCB? Sure, but that would add a lot of cost, complexity and unknowns to their right. design process. Um, you know, I, I know that uh, Particle, which also uh, does open source hardware, you know, they're, um, they have these like little cellular boards, like these feather boards, and they were used in like every e-scooter, you know, like those like scooters that you can rent and then like you leave them on the sidewalk and people trip over them. So the <laughs> thing inside of them that tracks where they are, the GPS and cellular network that like logs the distance, that's all done with, these open source hardware modules because the scooter company is like we're not a hardware company we're a scooter mm -hmm. company we just want to like embed this thing that works so you know it's like do people use linux because like it actually does a better job than some like non-open source operating system like well I'm, I'm running windows right but i've also run linux you use a tool that's appropriate for your needs um, there are some situations where Linux does a lot better and it happens to be open source and that's a pro and sometimes that is part of the use case, but it's more important for the hardware to fulfill people's needs. And in some cases, the openness is what fulfills their needs. John Lilly and Alyssa Wright both raised the point that understanding how open source may or may not fit into your supply chain and the value proposition that you offer to your customers is very important. And sometimes it's important, sometimes it's not. So I think you have to be to figure out for the right company. I mean, the, the biggest software IPO in history now was Snowflake and Snowflake's all proprietary from scratch. 
And so um, if you said, well, if you're not like taking advantage of open source, it's gonna make you go slower. Well, on that one, you were wrong, you lost a lot of money. Zoom, I think, is very, very, very low open source. It's almost all proprietary. But then there, there are huge companies that are open, like Elasticsearch and others that are, that are WordPress um, that are open source like uh, forever and ever. So I think it depends. I think you've got to have, like everything, you've got to understand how the supply chain, your software supply chain integrates with uh, sort of interacts with what you're trying to build in your consumer base and your distribution strategy and your monetization strategy. It's all got to kind of, it's all got to kind of hang together and every right. industry is a little different. Like successful ventures almost always like they're black swans. They almost never look like the thing before. And so reading too much about what's come before and what that implies about the, the shape of the company in the future, I think is right. kind of a sucker's game. Uh, I'm really always interested in, in companies um, also being aware of the value of the open source in, in their work and um, their supply chains. Um, that I think that is, will be really important information in trying to kind of construct a, a business plan. And then, um, and then the value of the entire, like you know, larger ecosystem that you fit into. Like what. What is this? You know, you're one project, in, you know, and maybe you're, maybe you're. It's applicable in like, you know, self-driving cars. Like, what does that quote market look like? You know, in in five, ten years, I, I think seeing and articulating and putting like real, like quantified, informed, you know, research numbers and examples um, for for the the value of your work, um, I, I think is is kind of like a, a starting point for building any sort of business model. Another common theme throughout the season was managing the risks associated with an open source supply chain and some of the ways in which open source components have fewer risks than proprietary components as part of a supply chain. You know, remember like the Volkswagen, like, you know, Volkswagen gate, which is like they had the diesel engine was being used, but it was like the they were lying about the you know, the efficiency of it, basically. Um, so the people who did that, they were using Adafruit sensors, right? So it's like, we didn't design the sensor for that use case, but they're like, okay. we have to measure um, the particulate output from this car. What should we use? Oh, Adafruit is documented. There's example code. We can get to the thing that we want to do um, without having to muck around. Um, you know, you can get off the shelf you know, sensor data acquisition systems, but they're thousands of dollars. And maybe these people are like, no, we want to be able to hack them and modify them and customize them for our own use. Um, we just saw that um, the ILM team uh, that does the Mandalorian, they used some of our NeoPixel rings in the model making of like the Razor Crest, the spaceship in this show. Did we design the NeoPixel rings for use? by ILM to make models. No, we designed it because we went to this goth club and this cool like goggle project we saw. We're like, we should make that, but like with like RGB LEDs. And so we made this product because I personally wanted this like weird cosplay project, but then it got used for other purposes because they're, you know, these this team, which is like, you know, Disney ILM, they have all the money, right? Like nobody has more money than the team working on Baby Yoda. Right. Like I wish I had their budget. <laughs> they could buy anything, right? They could they could have a custom engineer like design a custom board if they need to, but they didn't. Instead, they were like, here's some open source hardware that we can customize to make this cool flame effect on the spaceship, um, to make the controllers that we need to to do this special effects quickly and on the on a smaller budget than we need to, so we can spend the rest of the money on cheeseburgers and drinks. Um, you know, we have companies like, you know, SpaceX and Apple, they buy our components. What do they use it for? I don't fucking know. Like whatever they want. Right. Cause it's like, they, they get to do whatever they want. They don't have to sign documentation or NDAs with me. Right. They buy the hardware, um, and use it for oh, whatever. When the FDA had it? to do fast track ventilator work, um, folks used our hardware. Why? Because they had to quickly get known working hardware with microcontrollers and sensors to make ventilators. They had to do it in like less than a month. Um, they, they wanted something that was well documented, well understood, and that they didn't have to worry about what if this company, you know, I hate to say it, but they go out of business. Like I see people who do you know, they have hardware products that they sell them. The company goes out of business and the hardware is bricked. They can't use it anymore. There's no documentation. If you have a ventilator, you don't want your ventilator to get bricked. That's bad. You, it's, it should work forever, right? Uh, it should be easy to repair. Um, and, you know, if you're going to do an open source quick turn ventilator, that's important. So open source hardware fulfills many of these um, niches, but they're all kind of the same. Engineers have to get a product done to market 
that works, that's well documented, that doesn't kill them in the production cycle. Okay. Um, there's nothing worse than an engineer making a decision to go down some technical path and then realizing a month later that they're totally screwed because the documentation isn't complete. They can't get the support they need. Um, you know, the company folds, whatever. Um, with open source hardware, you don't have to worry about that, which is kind of nice, right? Yeah. You buy it and you have it forever. As long as the, the physicalness of it exists, the support and softwareness will work. And I think people who do software know the same thing. It's like, would you use a library if like you couldn't recompile it when the new Mac OS Big Sur comes out and like everything breaks? No, that sucks. It's better for using open source tools that you can then adapt and upgrade um, as technology improves. And like, I have lots of software that doesn't work on Big Sur. So I know that this is an issue. How do you manage that kind of risk profile across these really complex dependency trees that we have in open source products? Part of the, and everyone knows this from the CTO's office at Red Hat to the product managers to the, you know, we're responsible for the business, but still everybody from engineering to the CTO's office knows that security is a, a key value proposition of Red Hat, right? Like we know that's something that if we damage that piece, it will hurt our business. Um, and so we're paying attention to that supply chain. We have to, right? We we have to we have to do risk analysis, just like again an aircraft manufacturer would do analysis on a supply chain and say, can I get these bolts from China? You know, not to, I guess. Let me switch analogies. I mean, everyone knows the recent COVID stuff with the masks, right? Like like there was a 3M factory in China said, thank you, that's ours now. We'll take that, and then you can figure out how to make your own masks. I mean. That's what happens in times of crisis, right? Like there's going to be interruptions. These are, you know, network divisions uh, in, in, in uh, you know, uh, in network, you know, if you look at fault tolerance, right? Like supply chains are just something that you have to make fault tolerant. And so if there's a single point of failure, it's something you better be paying attention to, right? And I think there's both a qualitative and a quantitative component. You can look, are there other things we could change the supply chain to, like we did with Podman and Docker, like we did with you know, gears and Kubernetes, you can sometimes change the supply chain. Maybe that's a reasonable thing to do. But then there are these single point of failures like open SSL, right? Like, which are just like, it is what it is. Everybody uses it in the whole world. And you better have qualitative, you know, you better start putting more engineers and time and money and eyeballs on that. Like it, those are part of managing the supply chain. It's supply chain management in a nutshell. But to make sure your upstream vendors are healthy. But then how do you even know? $7 for fuel injectors instead of five. Because if you sell, if you if you only pay them five dollars and five cents, they're going to go out of business. You know, yeah, how do you say, identify pain, the pain. Right? because because you could yeah. put uh, you could put people on Open SSL, but if Open SSL depends on some C library that's been unmaintained for twenty years, um, that's that's a risk, right? So how do you even get an awareness of the depth and breadth of the dependencies that you have? Like we've seen some of those issues with. Um, um, with the, the JavaScript libraries that, that brought down yeah. half the internet, right? Uh, it's how do you gain an I mean, awareness of the risk profile that you're exposing yourself to as a vendor? I mean, there's I think there's two aspects. So one is how do you how do you proactively understand your supply chain? And so so that's about understanding what the components are in the supply chain and what they provide for you. And you usually don't do that all the way down to like left path to use your example of like. Uh, of JavaScript libraries because it'd be insane. Because on the day that you said like, well, is it dangerous to have a dependency on left pad? Like, what would your analysis be? The answer is no. No, it's not dangerous. It's like eight lines long. It pads a string to the left. It's really not like it's fine if you want to have that as a dependency. Um, do you need it as a dependency? I mean, no. But who cares? Like, as a like, no reasonable person would look at it and be like, oh, that is a risk in my supply chain. Now, what happens instead is the left pad bad day happens, something shenanigans. So then all of a sudden, everything, your supply chain breaks because of left pad. Now the question is, how quickly can you react to the disruption in your supply chain? Because that's actually what managing supply chains is more about. Yes, there is a process, there, there is a proactive part that's vetting, like, you know, should we take this dependency or not? Is it the right thing? Is it Podman or Docker? But then there's also just the, oh no, there's something wrong in my supply chain. How quickly can we turn around the fix how quickly can we repair what's broken and get it out to the world and that's really where you need to focus it's less on not that you don't focus on prevention of course you do but like you can't prevent it because the supply chain's so big and you're not and like that's just the nature of the universe like i don't know what the all the different pieces are in the supply the true supply chain for my software like uh 
uh, there's so much, so many. What I do know is how quickly I could turn around to fix. And that's where the customer product interaction comes in that says, look, it's part of the value prop here that I'm giving you with by certifying that supply chain is that I'm the one who will react to it and I'll react better than you and I'll react faster and I will get it in your hands and I will solve that problem for you right now. Yep. And, and that's one um, of the reasons why we talk about upstream contributions. I think personally, like it's, yeah. it should not be a bragging thing. Like, Oh, we have 22% of these, you know, it's not that it's just, uh, you need to express to the customer that you have enough involvement in the supply chain. Again, you're buying enough from Bosch that Bosch will fix the fuel injector when it's broken. Right. But this is, this is, I have enough engineers or, and QE people and docs people and all kinds of people participating in this upstream community. And they have enough expertise that they'll be able to react to a broken supply chain yes. quick enough, you know, Yes, or, or just even just a bug. Like like one of my favorite Red Hat stories of all time, not to turn it into a Red Hat festival, but personal, like I had this Oracle cluster that was failing all the time, rack cluster back in the day. And it was because there was this query we were running that was smaller than the size of a kernel task struct. And the, the memory would get fragmented and then eventually the kernel couldn't allocate a task struct anymore and the server would reboot uh, because it was like, oh, can't even. And then, the, and then eventually it did that and it corrupted the on-disk file system for Oracle. And no one could figure out how to fix this problem. The Red Hat person could tell me what the problem was eventually. Eventually they were like, I think the problem was this cash struct is due, like you run out of this. And then the like we had to whatever, hire this expensive dude who could like do the matrix dance and like read the raw file system. But both of those existed because there were vendors who knew that those people were real and could make them happen. Red Hat put a dude on a plane came to the sat next to me uh the dude who could crack open the raw file system and read it in hex and then see the line that was wrong and be like oh that's wrong and i'm like what's wrong he's like see that little hex there that's wrong and then he typed in the fix he just was like boop, 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 boop. <laughs> and i was like Whoa, what are you doing and he was like open it now and everything was cool and i was like what have you that is the scariest thing i've ever seen in my life and like but that's that is that is the product that's the product. That's um, the product. And 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 you know, it's not because it that can devolve into saying the product is support. It's not. It's not support. Like yes, in that instance, it's the support that I got, but it's the whole thing. It's the it's the fact that that exists, that those people are there. It's that that you have that twenty percent of the engineers who you know you can influence that roadmap, who could fix that Kubernetes bug, even if the other people in Kubernetes don't care. You know, Red Hat cares, and that's all that matters. Sumana Hari Haraswara and Matt Klein will round off this highlight video with a reminder that it's not all rosy in the open source world and that there are some risks associated with contributor burnout and project sustainability that as an industry we have to address. Excellent. Thank you, Aaron. Uh, Sumana, trends that you're seeing. Yeah, um, I am pasting something into the chat. By the way, there's a bunch of interesting conversation happening in the chat as well. I would say two things that I see as trends right now in the industry uh, have to do with open source sustainability and the desire for diversity and inclusion related consulting and uh, an improvement. So it's been, been years since Nadia Eggball wrote the Roads and Bridges report uh, about how we rely on so much infrastructure that isn't getting enough upkeep. And now, we've seen as an outcome of all of those conversations and of the underlying problem, a number of efforts uh, like Tidelift, uh, we see the rise of Open Collective, we see a lot more work being done with an effort. Uh, I think there's been more research being funded by you know, Sloan and Ford and more and so on about these, uh, these problems. And so now instead of, ah, this open source project is not sustainable, what could be done? Uh, the question becomes more among people who have been paying a bit of attention. Hmm. Okay. In order to improve the sustainability of this project, which of these paths should we follow? And how do we persuade people to let money get into the mix of something that perhaps previously was all volunteer and so on and so on. So, uh, and even the work that I've been doing right in writing gra grant proposals, it is only possible because there are funders who are funding that work, right? Like Mozilla, the Chan Zuckerberg initiative and so on. So that is something that's an interesting trend and I hope that it continues, right? I think that this is one of the ways that 
the industry that has made money off of open source software can invest in the continuing security and reliability of that infrastructure uh, in a variety of different ways, right? By funding things in a, uh, as I think of it, uh, systematic paying the maintainers of all of its infrastructure through something like Tidelift or in more targeted ways, like I think what Indeed has been doing with these directed monthly, okay, we're going to give money to some project that we depend on that people voted on internally, uh, or something like what Bloomberg just did, uh, paying part of the, the cost for my team to work on AutoConf. Um, and I'm pasting a link in the chat there. We have a lot of critical software that people depend on in a variety of different situations, whether it's um, via vertical products or services that we know and love, right? And it's not it's not always super clear how the software is maintained. Like what 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 is the status of the people that work on it? How close are they to burnout? Um, are they actually in the jobs that they want to be in? You know, like whatever their requirements are, you know, that would allow them to to keep working on these things. And um, I don't have any answers here. Like I think this is a really tricky topic, and it comes back to what we were saying before: is that it's really hard to prove the value of open source. And it's like I don't I don't really know how to how to prove that or not, but I do know that for a bunch of these projects, um, if the maintainers quit, uh, we are as an industry in a world of hurt, and I think we have to have more conversations about how to sustainably compensate some of these people and give them sustainable mm -hmm. jobs and have enough people that are working on it that are paid to do it that that we don't get burned out and it's like from a company perspective companies are always focusing on you know what's the what's the bus factor right or or, or like where are the single points of failure from a human perspective relatively little thought is given to this from an open source perspective. And, and I, I just think we have to have that conversation more. And I think the reason we don't have it is that it's very easy to point fingers, right? It's very easy to pass the buck and say, well, that's not really my problem. Like it's not, you know, it's just a thing. It's kind of like out of sight, out of mind. And again, I don't, I don't have any answers, but I think it's important to talk about. I, I saw an analysis um, by uh, the company Tidelift um, recently that said that you know the top ten percent of an application stack is written by the the people deploying it, so they own the they own the code, they're they're responsible for it. The bottom twenty percent, uh, you know, infrastructure, operating system components, um, C libraries, those are typically supported by large vendors, uh, so you can offload the risk there. And then you've got this middle 70%, which is all of the application libraries, the dependencies, the language runtimes, the, the developer frameworks, um, you know, the, the testing and programming tools that are all, essentially, we don't really know how they're developed and maintained, and there's very little commercial. But you, but you, but you talk about, run them. But, but even core libraries, we're, we're actually, looking at this recently, because we're looking at the supply chain of software for Envoy, and just very quickly, because I know that we're almost out of time, we're looking at Zlib, right? Like Zlib is probably, I would imagine, one of the widest used pieces of software in the entire world. Like it is literally everywhere, right? And there's basically no one working on Zlib. I think like the last commit was from like two years ago, and there's like open issues. And I, I mean, it, it's just, there, there is critical infrastructure that is that is not really maintained right now. So it's a it's a large conversation that has to be had. Thank you for watching. Next week we kick off season two of Open Source and Business with Martin Mikos, CEO of Hacker One and former CEO of MySQL AB, to talk about the open source database market. We will have one more highlight video from season one where we'll explore how open source values are relevant when starting a company. Be sure to subscribe so that you don't miss future episodes and we'll see you very soon.